Hey guys, my name is Pedron, and I'm a professional practice assistant professor in finance. I'm also a CFA charter holder. This is another episode of my crash course in machine learning concept, Simply Explained. Part 7 Machine Learning Solvers Great and Descent. We are gradually getting to a point that we understand how the machines actually learn the relationship in the data, how to learn the pattern. This is going to happen by the machines solving the parameters of the model. And today we're going to talk about the solvers. So what are the solvers? What are the learners in machine learning? What are we trying to solve actually? What are we trying to optimize? The answer is a loss function. So in machine learning, generally, we are trying to, to optimize a loss function, and that loss function is going to tell us how good or bad the model is making the predictions for a given set of parameters. So let me give an example. So for example, I think we are all familiar with the very simple regression model. So let's say y is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 x plus some errors, right? Then this is a very simple regression model, right? So what are the parameters? The parameters are beta 0, beta 1. And what is our loss function? We're trying to minimize the residual sum of squares, right? So basically, or sum of square or residual. So we are basically trying to minimize this guy. The summation of the residuals, we can show it with y minus y hat to the power of 2, right? So this is what we call our loss function. And in machine learning language, we usually show it with, with the function j. So in this case, the parameters are beta, so I, I can write it j beta. So this is a loss function, right? So in this case, it is a sum of square of residuals, right? The cost function has its own curvature and its own gradient. The slope of this curve will tell us how to update the parameters to make the model more accurate, right? So for example, in this very simple example of RSS, so maybe this is going to be our loss function, right? So in, in three dimension, it's going to be very well behaved, right? And these are the parameters, right? Beta zero, beta one. And uh, it's very well behaved. It means that it's continuous and it's differentiable at any point, right? And this slope at that point is going to navigate us toward the, the how we can update the parameters to make the model more accurate. Okay. Now the most the two frequent used optimization algorithms the, with the loss function when the loss function is differentiable are gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent. In this video, I'm going to cover the gradient descent, and in the next one, we will be, we will, we will be talking about why we should go beyond gradient descent. What are the caveats of gradient descent that it makes force us, at least for some machine learning models, to go beyond gradient descent? So, what is gradient descent? Gradient descent is an iterative optimization algorithm. It's an iterative solver, right? for finding the minimum of a function. And to find the local minimum of a function using gradient descent, we need to start from a random point and take the steps proportional to the negative of the gradients of the function at that point. So what does that simply mean? So imagine this is our uh, well-behaved function and you want to minimize it, right? So we're going to start from a random point. So for example, I start from here. Let me use another color. So from here, we start from a random point, and then the next steps are going to be proportional to the negative of the gradient. So here, for example, the gradient, in this case, two dimension, is a slope. So a slope is negative. So what is a negative negative? So I go to the right direction, right? So that's why we say we need to have that, we need to add that negative sign here. If I start from here, the slope is positive, so I have to go to the negative of the gradient, so I have to go this way, okay? And then finally, we will end up, hopefully, we will end up somewhere here, right? Which is the gradient is equal to zero, the slope is equal to zero. So let's write this iterative process in a mathematical uh, version formula and then introduce the parameters. And in the next slide, I'm going to show it uh, by going over a more detailed example how the process is done, okay? So theta j is the model's jth parameter, 
So imagine in this example that we had up to our simple regression model, we have two parameters, beta 0, beta 1. So we can call them theta 1, theta 2, right? So that's our theta. Alpha is what we call the learning rate. So this is going to play an important role down the road. So the, and we're going to look at the, how the, the gradient descent is working based on different alpha, based on different learning rates. Okay. And J theta is what we call our loss function, right? So in this case, uh, the loss function is differentiable. So remember, to do gradient descent, you need to have continuous parameters. So in this case, beta 0, beta 1 th that we had for the simple random regression are perfectly continuous, right? And the loss function must be differentiable with respect to that. If your parameter is not continuous, then you cannot simply use gradient descent, okay? And if the parameter, and if the loss function is not well behaved, then we have to go beyond gradient descent, which is the topic for the next video. Okay. All right, now let's visualize the gradient descent uh, iterative process. So this is an iterative process. That's why we are using this sign. So let me give you a numerical example, and hopefully it's going to make a lot more sense. Imagine our loss function is something very well behaved. It's continuous and uh, it's differentiable at any point, right? And imagine I have, let me use some very simple numbers. So just for the sake of argument, these are our actual ones. There's This loss function has only one parameter. The parameter is theta j. And so the loss function is going to be j of theta j, right? And imagine these are number two, three, four that the parameter can take. Just for the sake of argument, I picked the very simple numbers. And alpha is our learning rate, and this learning rate is going to control the size of an update. So imagine, in this case, alpha is going to be 0.5. We're going to talk about uh, different values of alpha in the next slide, and how it's going to change the behavior of the uh, uh, gradient descent approaching to the solution. Okay. Now, let's say we start from, and let me give you some other extra information, and then we're going to go over that uh, numerical uh, iterative process. So I'm going to assume that the slope on this side is going to be equal to minus 1, and here the slope is going to be plus 1, and here, of course, the slope is 0. Again, I'm using very simple numbers to make sure that we can follow the calculations. Okay, now let's start, imagine we say, okay, we're going to start from this point, right? So our theta j, and we're using this formula. So our theta j is going to be number two, right? So number two, this is, we start from here. Let's say we randomly start from there, is going to be equal number two minus alpha is 0.5. And the slope at that point is minus one, right? So if you calculate this number, it's going to be two minus minus 5.5 .5 is 2.5. And it's iterative process. So we're going to replace this with this. So the next point is going to be 2.5, right? So we go from point two to 2.5. So as you can see, we are going to the right, in the right direction, 2.5. And next step, 2.5 minus 0.5 is the alpha. And what's the slope here? So here again, for example, let me use green. Assume that this slope here is less and maybe it's 0.5, minus 0.5, okay? So if this slope is the minus 0.5, then it's, 2.5 minus 0.25, it's 2.75, right? So again, we're going to the right direction, and now it's 2.75. And then you get the idea. It's going to repeat this iterative process until we get to the point that the slope is equal to zero. Where is that point? Number three. So, and then we get there, look at that. The algorithm is going to stop. Why? Because it's three minus, what's the alpha? 0.5, what's the slope? Zero, so it's going to be three. And then it's going to replace three by three. So basically it's going to get stuck there, right? So this is the case if we start from the left, from the random point here. 
And I want you to practice the, this exercise that what if you start from here? And if you repeat this numerical example, you should do the calculations and you will see that the algorithm is going to go in this direction and finally stop here at number three. So this is how the gradient descent actually is going to do the job, right? And remember guys, gradient descent proceeds in what we call epochs. And the, each epoch consists of using the entire train set to update each parameter. So when we go from, so this is our parameter, when we go from 2 to 2.2, you're using the entire data set to calculate that slope and go to the right direction, right? So as you can guess, if, so this is one of the caveats of gradient sense that later on we're gonna talk about it, right? If your data set has millions of records, so in order to update your parameter each time, it, it has to go, the model has to go over the entire 1 million record of the data, right? So this is why the gradient descent for large data sets is going to be a little slow. And we're gonna talk about those things later on. All right. Now let's see how does a gradient descent work if we want to optimize two parameters, right? So in this example, we were looking at one parameter. Now, what if we have two parameters? Let me go ahead and try to erase these things. And I'm going to show you a plot on the right-hand side that we are using gradient descent to optimize two parameters, okay? Here is the case. So imagine this is our loss function. This is the J theta, uh, let's say why we have theta zero and theta one. And as you can see, well, it is relatively well behaved because it's continuous and differentiable at any point. Uh, but as the, it seems that we have multiple minimums, right? So maybe there is a minimum here, there is a minimum there, there is a minimum here. And we're going to talk about uh, those multiple minimums or local minimums and how we should go beyond the gradient descent. But for now, let's focus on gradient descent and imagine this is the best, this is our global minimum and we were lucky enough to start from this point and use gradient descent algorithm, right? So we use gradient descent algorithm and this is how it's going to do the job. So we will start with a random theta zero, theta one. Imagine this is our random number, theta zero, theta one. And the algorithm is going to calculate the gradient because it's, in, it's not sloping. We call it gradient because it's in more than one dimension, right? The gradient and uh, go to the right direction by using this equation. And uh, then keep, repeat this process every single time. And remember, every time it's going to use one epoch, which is the entire data set, and eventually get to a point that the gradient is equal to zero and get stuck here. And this is going to be the optimal value for, let's say, theta star zero and theta star one. But what I want you to remember that this is, uh, when we are doing gradient descent and we have multiple parameters, the parameters are being updated simultaneously. So it's not like that theta zero is going to be optimized first and then theta one. No, theta one and theta zero are going to be optimized simultaneously at each step. Uh, and then it's going to be calculate the gradient and update the parameters like this. All right. Now in the next slide, let's talk about the, what will happen if we deal with different learning curves. What if the learning curve is large? What if it is small? This is what we refer to as learning rate schedule, right? So let's start by saying if alpha is too small. So if alpha is too small, we're talking about the green curve. And the gradient descent can be slow, right? So here, this is our cost function. Let's say there's only one parameter beta and you're looking at, uh, no, we're starting from here. If alpha is too small, yes, we are going in the right direction, but the steps are very small, right? And remember guys, for each update, the model needs to go one epoch, the entire train set. So that's when the alpha is too small. When the alpha is too large, then what will happen? The gradient descent can overshoot, right? So here, look at this example. Imagine you start from here, the alpha was too too large. It was so large that when we use this formula, we completely went to the other side. And then we went to this side again, but eventually, hopefully, we hope that it fluctuates a lot and you'll converge to this point, right? 
but uh, sometimes it may fail to, to even converge, right? It depends on, uh, on that alpha, right? And in some cases, when alpha is very, very, very large, when the learning rate is very large, so it's going to maybe completely get off the rail, right? So as we start from here, instead of going to the right direction, it goes to the wrong direction. It com diverges completely, right? Instead of converging to the minimum, okay? So what is the optimal alpha? Probably something in between, right? Not that small, not that high. So maybe this is a best rate for alpha, right? Somewhere in between, and we can we can plot the cost function or loss function versus epoch or the iteration, and we'll see that when the 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 alpha the, the is uh, relatively optimal, is up, this is our optimal learning rate, the loss function is going to decrease dramatically uh, after each epoch, right? But if the alpha is too small, it's going to take a lot of time. And remember, each of these updates needs us to go over one epoch, which is the entire train set. And if the alpha is too high, we may end up the, the it may change. Well, the, maybe the cost function is going to decrease dramatically. But the problem is that maybe we cannot minimize cost function enough, right? And of course, if it is very large, so the cost function is going to increase instead of decreasing. All right. Now let's finally talk about why sometimes we need to go beyond grade and descent. Okay. So basically, we can answer that question by focusing on disadvantages of grade and descent, right? So the first disadvantage is that it's something we call it's a single batch, right? So it means that grade and descent is going to use the entire train set to update a parameter. Right for each, and uh, we know for large data set, it's going to take a lot, long time. And it's also sensitive to the choice of learning rates. In the previous slide, we saw, we saw that if learning rate is too small or too large, it's going to uh, makes our job, uh, the, the algorithm's jobs difficult to minimize the cost function. And uh, finally, we, are, we, are, we already said that it's going to be slow for a large data set because remember, if the data set is, uh, is millions of records for each update, it has to go over the entire data set. So what's the solution? The solution is something what we call mini batch stochastic gradient descent. So it's a version of the gradient descent algorithm that speeds up the computation by approximating the gradients instead of using the entire data set, use a smaller subset of that. So we call it smaller batch, right? And the stochastic gradient descent itself, it has its own variations or upgrades. And uh, I think uh, in the next video, I'll talk about a couple of those upgrades, namely Adagrad and Adam. All right, let's wrap it up by going over this, in my opinion, very funny meme of the day. I want you to focus on this conversation between you and Lisa Squares. If we get the point of this joke, write it down in the comment section. See you in the next one. Until then, take care.